I am glad to be with you uh, as we cap this consideration of what God wants to do in the world around us. And basically, God doesn't like zap things and make things happen 99.9% of the time. What he uses are very special hands and hearts and minds. And don't get scared, this is not too sensational, but the hands that he uses look just like this. Very ordinary hands. If you would look at your hands right now, this is like a, a group participation exercise. If you would look at your hands right now, the shocking thing is these are the sorts of hands that God uses to accomplish his kingdom purposes. The king has arrived. When he arrived, many people recognized that he was Mashiach, as we say in Hebrew. He was the Messiah. But only a minority did. And he said, I'm going to go away because the people to whom I came, for the most part, did not recognize me. And use this time to build my invisible kingdom. We're not here to build a visible kingdom. We're not here to take a political control and to have some sort of a force uh, to force people to believe. That will never happen. Pe that happens in the heart. When a person comes to believe, he is transferred from this domain into the domain of the kingdom of God. And that's what we're here to talk about. So as we look at the first slide, there are some realities that you and I need to, to really to come face to face with. And that's the fact is that we all have ambitions. The question is going to be how lofty are your ambitions or how worthless are they? How low are they? Your ambitions are that which often drives the things you choose to spend money on, the things that you spend your time on. We all have ambitions. And the next slide here is a, a, a fellow from, uh, and go, even go to the next one. For those of you who are of a certain age, kind of my age, you recognize the, the fellow in the slide. John Glenn was an American astronaut. And in 1962, the photo on the left, he became the first American to uh, basically to orbit the Earth. And it was a monumental achievement. Uh, it was an example of 10, 15 years of his preparation as a, a pilot, as a scientist. And he had many then years. He didn't go off into the sunset. He went into public service. And he became a US senator. He did a number of other things. And then at the age of 76, he got a phone call. Would you be interested in going back into space next year when you are 77? And he thought about it. His wife said, no, no, no. And he said, here am I, send me. And at the age of 77, he became the oldest man ever to orbit the Earth where he conducted a number of experiments. They had experiments on him they wanted to see how that age body would stand up to space travel. And so he here makes a statement that is very on point for all of us. And the statement he made is this. If there's one thing that I have learned in my years on this planet, it's that the happiest and most fulfilled people are those who devoted themselves to something bigger and more profound more important than merely their own self-interest. If we were to be honest with ourselves, we would quickly recognize that most of our time and energy is devoted to our own self-interest, our own little projects, our own little corner. And we seldom look up, lift our eyes, See, in the scripture it says, lift your eyes and, and look and see that the fields are ready for harvest. 
They're white on to harvest. It's, it's meaning that the plant is ready to be harvested. And when he had to tell them to lift their eyes, there's a, a thought there that they hadn't had their eyes lifted. Instead, their eyes were on their own small self-interests. He wanted to have them move on up from their own very small interests to far greater interests, the kingdom of God. And that's our goal as well. Our desire is to build the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not made of bricks and mortar. It's not made up of this building, but it's made up of all the people in this auditorium and around the world who have come to saving faith that Jesus is the Messiah that God first promised Israel and then promised to all of the peoples of the world. And it's only through his intervention that we can be born again into the family of God. There's a conversation in John chapter 3 between two rabbis. And in that most famous of conversations, the older rabbi, the learned rabbi, Nicodemus, was pondering how can a person be born again. I've already done all the spiritual things, but he had done all of the things that were earthly and fleshly. He had not yet done business with the Lord God. And that's why Messiah Jesus said, you must be born again. The first time you get born into a family, the second time you get born into the family of God. It's not something theoretical, it's not a sort of mathematical construct, but it is a reality. We all have, as the Hebrew says, a nefesh, or sometimes we'd say in Yiddish, a neshama. Our neshama says it's going to spend eternity either apart from God or with God. Are we in the family of God? Are we making family priorities our priorities? Now we'll take us to the next slide. Because the reality is that we have, as a body of believers been involved in this subject for years particularly over the last three days here at grace there have been a number of seminars on both campuses where we've had full-time workers who are specialists in their field and they've devoted their time and their energies and their resources to something larger than themselves uh, I was sitting back, I didn't have any speaking uh, obligations these three days, so I was sitting back and enjoying seeing how they had put aside small ambitions and had signed on to a much greater outfit, and that outfit is the kingdom of God. They willingly presented their hands and allowed God to use them. The O'Connors brought a, a wonderful story uh, that first night about how God had taken a situation which could have resulted in them being sidetracked, in mourning. Oh, woe is me. And they presented themselves for this new opportunity of service. And they said, here am I, Lord, send me, just as the, the praise team had said. They said, Hineni, in essence in Hebrew, here am I, I present myself. Every situation is going to be different, every single one. And the various workers that we've had exemplified all of those things. So why is it? How in the world are we qualified to do the work of God with these ordinary hands? In the next slide, there's a scripture passage, which is uh, very illuminating. And uh, it is... I know it's a little uh, small in print there, but in Genesis chapter, uh, I'm sorry, in Colossians chapter 1, there is a very pertinent sort of position that we have uh, taken. Let me read that to you. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and following, we give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Understand that first word. He's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. If someone dies, you know, great-grandpa dies, and there's a reading of the will, the people who have part in the inheritance are not strangers on the street. They're not people who have been disinterested in the family, but rather they are family members who showed up 
They are sharers in the inheritance. And that's the language that this Colossians passage uses. It says there, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And that's to remind us that sitting in one kingdom or the other is not theoretical. There's a passage in the scripture that says, uh, before Messiah came, the Gentiles were sitting in darkness in the shadow of death. They were in the domain, the kingdom of darkness. We're all gripped by members of some sort of kingdom. So he delivered us from that domain of darkness. He transferred us at the moment we came to believe, at the moment we were saved, he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. Just as, not to sidetrack our brains, I remember as a kid, you saved up the green stamps and you went to the redemption center and you were able to trade in this pile of motley looking books that were like 10 years old at this point, because it takes a long time, and you were able to redeem them for something of, of greater value. Well, we presented ourselves as kind of worthless uh, vessels, but we have been redeemed by the blood of Messiah. He paid our debt. So we are now in his family. So the passage goes on. In him we have redemption, we have the forgiveness of sins, and he is before all things. In him all things hold together. He is the head of the body. When you came into the kingdom, you became a member of the body of believers. And that is a, a simple reality. He is before all things. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead. So that in all things he might have first place. So we say there the reality is that you were in the domain or the kingdom of darkness. But now you've been brought into the light. That is a metaphor that is used throughout scripture having been in darkness and being transferred to light. Throughout scripture, we see that reality, that uh, we have something that is far greater than we could have ever accomplished on our own. Only an act of God could have taken us from wallowing in sin, being in the domain, again, the kingdom of darkness, to the kingdom of light. That's why we're calling this the Kingdom Conference because ultimately we are identified with one kingdom or another. People imagine, because things are going well, people imagine that they can kind of skate the middle line. You know, they're gonna weave between the cars and kind of get away with it. But ultimately we are identified, we've got a stamp on us of being a member of one kingdom or another. If we have do not have our sins redeemed if we do not receive the atonement a word that is very popular in Jewish circles the most holy day of the year is Yom Kippur the day of atonement on that one day you go into synagogue you daven you 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 reflect before God and you ask God to forgive your sins and that's all well and good but it will only take you so far because ultimately the scriptures say there is no name under heaven by which we can be saved, transferred into the kingdom of, of light, other than the name of Messiah Jesus. And so that is a reality for all people. No one gets into this kingdom of light by means of, oh, I was born to so-and-so, you know, or I'm Jewish, or I'm Italian, or I'm this, or I'm that. No one gets in automatically. You, don't, you have to come to a moment of born-again faith. Romans chapter 10 is, if you believe, you will be saved. The issue is that do we have faith that Jesus is whom he said he was? Once again, simply being born into a believing family does not cut it. If you were born in a bakery, it doesn't make you a bagel. Uh, <laughs> it's very, very simple. You must be born again into the kingdom of God. That is an act that only God can accomplish and he accomplishes it in reaction to our faith. 
It's a pattern that goes back to the earliest part of Scripture. It's not something that was invented in the New Testament. It's not something that was invented by any church. You go back into the earliest pages of the Jewish Bible, book of Genesis, Bereshit, and you see there that Abraham, against all odds and against all rationality, believed something that God had just told him, even though it did not seem to make sense. But the scripture says that Abraham believed God, and God counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham became, as we say in Hebrew, a tzaddik. He was righteous because he had exercised saving faith. In every age of time, in every dispensation, it has only and always only been faith. Keeping law, keeping rules and regulations never saved anyone. I'm no longer under law. You folks were never under law. But rather we've all come to embrace the same sort of faith that Abraham had. And that was faith in something that seems implausible. It seems unlikely. But we exercise faith. There is a little, a little space that we have to jump over. Do we take God at his word? Do we believe what God has said? Throughout scripture, we have examples of men and women who took God at his word and did fantastic things for the kingdom. They were rather ordinary people oftentimes. Rahab wasn't even Jewish. And she recognized that her moment of opportunity to step into faith had just come. And even though it was potentially dangerous, she said, oh yeah, they went that away. <laughs> As she harbored the, the Hebrew uh, footman. And so we recognize that God is going to often call us to do very difficult things. But he's going to use ordinary vessels. Don't need a seminary degree. Don't need any sort of degree. But you need to follow God at his word. It's very helpful to know his word and to take it at face value and to understand it, and then helpful to see examples in other believers. That's what scripture calls us to do. Uh, so we were, tr we were in the domain of darkness, but now brought into light. And so here's the opportunity. We're now on the winning team. You know, our previous identity was as those who are going to live out 80, 90, maybe 100 years of life, and then there'd be a pleasant funeral service. Nowadays, there'll be a little notice on the funeral parlor webpage. They'll put up a little notice. And in 10 years, that might be the only thing that you're remembered for. However, if you are on the winning team, you have opportunity to be written in God's book of saints and to have your nefesh, your soul, transferred from that place to that place when these bodies are worn out because our souls are that which are eternal. And so what we want to do is recognize that we're now on the winning team. There's another verse in the next slide. And in that verse, uh, taken from Matthew, we read it to you. In Matthew it says, Don't share up treasures on earth. Moth and rust can destroy them, and thieves can break in and steal them. Instead, store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. Thieves cannot break in and steal. Your heart will always be where your treasure is. Words of Messiah Jesus. A lot of people accumulate toys and gifts because we say here that the world hangs ever-changing trinkets in front of us. They dazzle, they distract you see an ad for the latest iPhone, iPad, whatever they've got nowadays. Uh, and, yo, oh, I've got to have that. And you go out and you, you spend $1,000 for this brand new trinket. And just as you're showing it off to your friends, comes the announcement, oh, that iPhone 14 is now obsolete. You need iPhone 15. <laughs> Only $1,400. That's why I have an Android, an old one. <laughs> because the world will constantly dangle this in front of you. You absolutely need this. 
to feel important. You absolutely need this to be a real person. You absolutely need this to be in with the, the, the cool kids. But the reality is the things always change. The trinkets that they dangle in front of us always glitter, but they're always like tinfoil. They're always like uh, quickly, they, they become uh, musty and they become uh, rotted. And that's the nature of the things of this world. We don't want to be in the, the world that is perishing. Now, to be sure, we have responsibilities in this world. It was wonderful to be sitting out there and seeing a parade of parents come in holding lots of children. Some were being dropped off at the children's uh, center down the hall. Others were finding, oh, I want to stay with you. I've got to hear this guy with the beard. <laughs> and, um, or if you just bring him in here, it's a good way to put him to sleep. <laughs> And so, you know, it was wonderful to see that. So you've got responsibilities, moms and dads. You've got responsibility to your family. Some of you have responsibility to older parents, and you're kind of sandwiched in between. Understood. Those are God-given responsibilities. If God has equipped you and allowed you to be in those situations, he wants you to, to take up those responsibilities. And that's why it will be that some people are able to do different things in the kingdom. It seems to be more, and other people are doing other things that seem to be less. But you see, there is no hierarchy in the kingdom of God. That's why evangelical pastors and speakers, we don't use fancy titles. The most reverend doctor, right reverend so-and-so, apostle, you know, all, of these, all of these titles that are, that are kind of self-awarded. Uh, from a diploma mill of your own imagination. They don't exist. There is no hierarchy. There's no one better than the other. Jewish believers are no better than Gentile believers. Even the term chosen people simply means that God chose a certain people to accomplish a job. Not because they were better, not because they'll get extra perks, but to accomplish a job he entrusted with them. Oftentimes the oldest child in a family is entrusted with responsibilities. So we want to understand the futility of trying to endlessly accumulate stuff because reaching for them is a never-ending obsession. You've got to have the latest. In the next slide, there's a passage from 1 Peter. We want to understand as well the, the ultimate foolishness, futility of, of endlessly going around trying to please the world. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, as believers... You have turned from your own desires and want to obey God. You have already lived long enough. This is the contemporary English version. You've already lived long enough like people who don't know God. You were immoral. You followed your evil desires. You went around drinking, partying, and carrying on. You worship disgusting idols. That's what the text says. And so that describes us before we came to faith. But now we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We now have an inheritance in Messiah, because of Messiah Jesus in the kingdom of the Father. We bear his image. We are sons and daughters of the king. First Colossians, uh, in Colossians and in uh, First Peter, there are passages that talk about us not having light of our own, but rather us reflecting the light of Messiah into an ever-darkening world. That's what we want to be about. And if we get out of the way, then God can use us to do that. So we understand that people-pleasing is an endless cycle and invariably winds up putting God in second place. And ultimately, that time spent with believers who put God first will mold and encourage us. That's why some of these sessions of the Kingdom Conference were so encouraging as we saw people to, who were doing that. Final slide here is taken from Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 says, We are God's workmanship, created in Messiah Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared for us in advance to do. I'm going to read that once more. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, were created in Messiah Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
You don't get saved by doing good works. You get saved by faith alone in the finished work of Messiah alone. But then as a result of being transferred from a bad kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light, we then are equipped to do good things. We actually have a list which God has prepared for us to do. And those are things that oftentimes God has gifted us for. God doesn't ask, you know, someone who's like very large and, and kind of wide to be a ballerina. Okay? He's not going to ask you probably to be on the praise dance team. Maybe there are exceptions. Don't want to get in trouble. But that's, that's probably not what you're equipped to do. But when I look at the folks on the team here, the music team, God has gifted them with an ear. They can hear the ear. They can feel the rhythm. They can count out the time. It's almost like another language. For the years I spent um, leading a praise team, it, we, we were almost were able to talk to one another. Uh, you, could, you could hear in a half second uh, where someone was going. So they have an ability. They've surrendered their talents to be used for the kingdom. Oftentimes, the opportunities that God presents to us will align with our interests and our desires and give us pleasure and joy. I'll never forget some of the times I've been here and I saw a young boy wailing away on the drums, hair flying, and he was having the time of his life. That was Tobias, Kenny, Kenny and Anita's son. He was loving what he was doing. And it was all in time. He wasn't going off on his own. He knew dad was right there to you know, keep him in line. But he was enjoying himself. And God was using him to bless all of us and to keep the band on time. So God had chosen a task for Tobias to do that also would play into his strengths and would give him pleasure and, and would encourage him along the path that God has chosen for him. God has shovel-ready jobs for each one of us. I don't know what they are for you, but this is a good place to find out because it's the, in the body of Messiah, the local congregation, where we are to exercise those gifts. This is the primary place where those gifts are put on display. So I might encourage you to pray about what God might want you to do. There's all kinds of opportunities here and just outside. VBS is coming up. They need a lot of uh, people for VBS because it impacts the community powerfully. Many people had their first introduction to the body of Messiah through bringing their kids to VBS. And so they need volunteers for VBS. There'll be training sessions, uh, volunteers for all sorts of things. And also the, the various partner ministries that have been displayed here over the last few days all have local ministries. There are ministries in Newark and Patterson, uh, in the local area. Some of our uh, ministry partners are the ones who lead those. So there are many opportunities for you to use very ordinary hands to do a very holy task. And that is to put them to work for the kingdom of light the kingdom of which you now are a part. Would you pray with me? Our oh Lord God, we praise you, we thank you for so great a salvation. Our oh Lord God, we praise you that so long ago in the pages of Scripture, you promised to send Messiah. The promise was kept and Messiah Jesus was born. When we come to trust in him, he takes our sin as far as east as from the west so far does he take our sin away. Our Lord God, we praise you for that precious truth and we pray that you would, you would put your hand on each person here who has come to faith and they would recognize that you're calling them to do something for the kingdom. Let us be found leaving behind our small ambitions and go on to the doing, being a superstar in the kingdom of God no matter what we do. Our Lord God, we pray these things 
B'Shem Yeshua Meshachenu, in the matchless name of Jesus our Messiah, Amen and Amen. God bless you.